But the glory of Christmas, uh, the message of the shepherds, I believe pretty clearly, this message was for everyone. This little baby, this gift from God, if it was first communicated, as we've seen just a second, to the shepherds, the lowest of the lowest, he said, maybe it includes us too. And one of our challenges every week is always, how do I get them to listen? How do I get their attention? So I came up with a great idea. I was going to require reservations for church today. Like if you don't have a printed ticket at the door, you don't get in. That was problematic. So I didn't go any further with this idea. But until I realized that I couldn't do it, I wanted to do that because then for each person that registered, I was going to call a person that knew them well and find out what they wanted most for Christmas. Grace, what do you want for Christmas? All right, she doesn't know. <laughs> Danny, help me out. What do you want for Christmas? Danny, okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, man. You see, this is why I didn't do this. this <laughs> yes. Shoes, thank you. So what I was going to do then is go buy the shoes. Okay, I found exactly what. And there would have been 127 packages on the stage this morning. That would have been impressive. And I would have picked up the first one. This has been the whole sermon. Uh, Bree. And Brie would have walked up with Hannah. She would open it right in front of us. Camera would have zoomed in on her face. She would, oh, it's just what I wanted. I go, it's for you. And then I go get Trevor's. And he'd come up. Oh, it's just what I wanted. And we'd hear 127 times, I'm estimating. It's just what I wanted. And by the time we sang the last song and we wandered out of here with our 127 packages, somebody would tell somebody tomorrow about their church. You say, you, can't, you won't believe what happened in my church yesterday. I just showed up. I almost wasn't going to go, but I got reservations, so I went. And the pastor handed me the sh exact shoes I've been asking for. Uh, they're, look. They're going, no way. Going, and every single person there got what they wanted. Would you tell anybody that? Yeah, I think he would. And that's just a, oh man, that's less than 10% of the point today. Because as, as clearly as that would have communicated, hey, this is about you. You can be with your family. Uh, <laughs> this is about you. You got your shoes. Oh, I'm sorry. That was you, Danny. <laughs> okay. I got you. Uh, the point is everyone have clearly communicated, have been communicated to them, this gift is for you. This gift is for you. This gift is for you. And 127 times, this gift, it's, it's for you. That's just a tiny speck of what I believe today's story tells us that God is trying to communicate today. He stepped into history in an incredible way by sending Jesus Christ, his son, as a baby. We so gloss over that and take it for granted when he set the nativity scene up on your, mantle, on your fireplace mantle. He sent his son as a baby. And it was for you. Doesn't matter who you are, what you do, where you live, or how you smell. It's for you. It's for everyone. So let's take a look at the story where I get that. It's Luke chapter 2, uh, verses 8 to 15. We'll just kind of read. This is the entire story for the shepherds. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them. We read that like it's... Suddenly an angel appeared among them. Uh, we don't get all the details. We'll get some more details, I think, in heaven. They wet their pants. <laughs> An angel suddenly appeared. And the radiance of God's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. And didn't make up the wetty pants thing. It's right there in Scripture. They were terrified. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid. That's easy for you to say. An angel just suddenly appeared to me. <laughs> he says, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. If you fall asleep later, go back and read this sentence. That's the point of the message. I bring you good news 
that will bring great joy to all the people. We'll get back to it in a second. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, a little baby has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you'll recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a barn. It's actually a cave, but in a manger. No GPS or address. It's kind of funny that, of course, Bethlehem is not a huge town because it's kind of funny. It's funny that's all they had to go on, but that's what they had. So suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, as if one angel is not petrifying enough. And they were praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those whom God has pleased. Boom. The angels have returned to heaven. The shepherds said to each other, wow, what was that? And they said, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has told us about. That's an important part of the, the, the little phrase there. The angel told us. He wanted us to know about this gift. So let's go back, as I said, to verse 10. Don't be afraid, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all the people. The all people, the everyone, this gift is for you, again, is the point. I've said it four times, I'll say it four more. But let's just focus on the entire verse. Stop first at good news. Good news literally is a translation in the Greek from the word gospel. The gospel message of what God did by sending Jesus is good news. So in our NLT Bible that we use here at River's Edge, uh, think of Romans chapter 1. Every time most translations would say gospel, I think it's uh, six or seven times in the first 11 verses, uh, our NLT says good news. Verse 16 says, I'm not ashamed of this good news, the gospel, about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. Who's it safe? Everyone. This is for you. It is for every. And Jesus, when he references this to the disciples, uh, he says, I bring you, it's the good news that will bring great joy. He's in John 15 talking to just his disciples up in the upper room. Chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16. In the middle of that, he's already told them that he's going to be killed. The Holy Spirit's coming to replace him. That, that'd blow your mind if you're a disciple. And he said, you can still connect to me. I'm, I'm the vine. Just remain in me. Abide in me. Stay connected to me. We use that passage around here quite a bit. But then he says in verse 11, I've told you these things. All of that, including that he's leaving. That would not bring joy if I'm a disciple of the last three years. Because I've told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. There could not have been better news than the fact that Jesus was coming. It was good news that will bring great joy because it finally puts together us into a relationship with God that we were created to have. Amazing. And then finally, again, it is for all people. Uh, Paul says it this way in 1 Timothy. There's one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man, Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. For everyone. Uh, who did that cover? Everyone. Do you see a pattern yet? This is the message God gave to the world at just the right time. At just the right time. The message is for everyone. So we know that God desires to be in a relationship with you. As our presence, this is for you. Doesn't matter, again, who you are, what you do, or how you smell. It's for you. He desires a relationship with everyone. And the shepherds are just one little indicator. If you pick the lowest of the low, as Dan, our shepherd, said, it includes you. And if you would have started maybe with the princes and princesses and then said, hey, go tell this story, they probably would have told the other upper class. But when someone got down to, hey, who's going to tell the shepherds? Sadly, they probably would have said, oh, who cares about the shepherds? <laughs> Jesus turned that upside down. He said, this is going to start with the shepherds, just in case anybody questions the fact. This is for everyone, because this is for the shepherds. 
and they'll start telling their friends, and the word will get out, but it's for everyone. And if it's meant for everyone, someone's got to tell somebody. I believe the disciples, uh, the, the shepherds, certainly told people the next day. And when the, when the morning shift came in, you don't think that as they handed the sheep off, they said, dude, you should have worked last night. We were there playing euchre. <laughs> An angel came. <laughs> Right. <laughs> well, and then, then there were hundreds of angels. <laughs> right. I mean, they, you guys got to stop drinking them while you're watching the sheep. Someone will come. I mean, th- that, that is craziness. But you know they told their story. Just as I know you tell your story if you got your shoes this morning. Uh, this is for everyone. So let's look at the everyone uh, three more verses. Just to really pound that one home. First one here is in Second Peter, chapter 3, Peter, again, one of the inner circle, the three s- disciples often referred to as off with Jesus as the inner circle of three, Peter, James, and John. He says, the Lord is not really being slow about his promise. We just read that Paul said he came at just the right time, remember? And he'll come back at just the right time. He's not slow, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. This is for everyone. It's again and again and again. This word repent is important. It would literally mean change directions. And it implies to everyone, because if this is really everyone, it means the, the person that seems to be the best, nicest, kindest, and the person that's kind of a jerk. But any of us... <laughs> would be on a path uh, of making the choices that seem best for me, the direction I want to go, the place I want to get, the destination I want to reach, and how I want to reach it. And even if I have religion as a part of my life, or even read the Bible sometimes, even if I sit in church once in a while, I can still be very, if I'm honest, focused on me and what I want for me. And if I never stop to think about it, off off stage for one. (laughs) Uh, But this verse says, at some point, there needs to be a change. A repent that I literally change direction and say, it's still me, but I'm not first now. God has accepted me, forgiven my sin. He wants to be in a relationship with me. I want that relationship. I want to go where he wants me to go. I want to be who he wants me to be. I want to do what he wants me to do. That's repent. And that decision comes at some point in our lives. Uh, Many of us can point back to a specific time. In some ways, it's ongoing, resisting, conforming to the world, and transforming being who God wants us to be. But it does start at a point where we would say you start a relationship with Jesus. Uh, when I talk about this, almost always, I'll talk about these five words. Uh, they're right from Youth for Christ. Many of you know I'm the director of Youth for Christ. I've been on staff for 46 years. So I, I think it sums it up best that we were made for that relationship that we've been talking about the whole time. The reason we don't have it, we resist it. We're the ones on our own path, ignoring God. And sin, not doing the things that God wants us to do, or doing the things he doesn't want us to do, is basically our attitude of ignoring God and being on our own path. We resist. The truth is, the bad news, we're talking good news this morning. The bad news, though, is I can't do a thing about that. I was created for relationship. I chose not to have it. I'd be stuck there because of my sin. I can't connect as a sinful person to a holy God. Nothing I could do. Nothing you could do except for the gift we're talking about this morning. Jesus came to restore that relationship, to reconnect us to God by paying the penalty for my sin by dying a death on the cross. It's in Scripture over and over and over again. And my responsibility, choice, is simply to respond to what God did. Say, God, I realize I was separated from you. I admit I sinned. Please forgive my sin. I choose to follow Jesus. And that response starts a relationship with God that literally lasts forever as I choose to remain in that relationship that Jesus talked about where we just referred to in John 15. The simplicity of the gift of the good news is for you. So when we look at how we respond to the shepherds this morning, response one is if you've never chosen to accept that relationship, accept it. 
no better time than Christmas for sure. Uh, sit right here quietly and ignore the rest of my sermon if you want to talk to God and tell him basically this. I want a relationship with you today. Go home and pray about it. Think about it. Sit in a lazy boy with a cup of hot chocolate or whatever you enjoy drinking. <laughs> Write down your five questions. Call your best friend that you know follows Jesus or call me if you don't have a friend. I'll be your friend. Call any pastor you know. We say this all the time. We mean it. Let's have a conversation about what you need to know to choose to accept this. But many of us, you go, hey, I come to church because I made that decision a long time ago. I did when I was eight. That's a long time ago. What about us? Well, I believe this gift also motivates us forward to share it with other people. Uh, one more verse before we leave this. Uh, because it's the one that's on the bed sheets at the football game this afternoon. And you need to know what it is. I, I've mentioned this before, but years ago on Monday Night Football, back in Howard Cosell Day, so what's that, 20 years ago at least, uh, that's when, when this start, first started appearing, the, one of the commentators actually said, what's this John 3 colon 16 thing? <laughs> Real scriptural giant there. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> one of the guys said, well, that's, uh, that's the, like, do, isn't that uh, do for others before they do it for you or one of the golden rule thing? And then the second guy said, oh, yeah, that's right. And then they, they went on. <laughs> that wasn't right. It says, this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son as a gift at Christmas so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. We have that relationship, even though we resisted it, if we simply let the fact that because God restored, we can respond and remain in him. The shepherds, when they heard it, if we jump down, I tried to give you the whole story. That was only through verse 15. Verse 20 at the end says this. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. So it's pretty clear that the message is something to be celebrated, but also something to be shared. Uh, and to come into Christmas and not have church folk get together and say, hey, is there something we should do about this? The glory of Christmas, this gift, I, I told you this morning, it's for you. You know several dozen other people. You know what? It's for them too. But it's very likely in a majority of those, of those cases, of the dozens of people you know, no one has ever told them. Fact. And you can at least ask today, is there somebody in my life that I should be telling? Jesus said, this showed up a couple of weeks ago, so it's interesting, it just fit here for sure. Uh, Jesus actually commanded his disciples to share and if you're his follower, disciple, it fits you. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, everyone, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Make disciples of all nations. So here we are. He didn't say that in Grand Ledge, Michigan. He didn't say that in Lansing. He didn't say that in Michigan. He didn't say that in the United States. He said that over in Israel. Here we are, another nation, a couple thousand miles away, worshiping God because someone shared that message. But there's 330 million people in our country. There's a few million that haven't heard. So Paul says, if you really think about this glory of Christmas, he didn't say this, but I think he implies it. If you really think about this and appreciate how much God must have loved us, you got to do something. And that's what Paul writes in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, either way, Christ's love controls us. NIV says, compels us, just pushes you out the door. Take your shoes this morning and walk out going, this was for me. And the gift of Christmas was for me and it's for everybody I know. Who can I tell? It should just compel you out this door. Since we believe Christ died for all, we also believe we have all died to our old life. We're not walking that way anymore. We're walking this way. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. 
So we've stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. That's a really important sentence. You might be sitting here this morning, you know, Trent, you've, I've heard before you've said, you know, I should share this truth with people. I don't know who to share it with. I, I get that. We get in our pockets of people, and maybe you haven't had a conversation with someone that's lost recently, hasn't made that decision. It doesn't mean you might not have one this week. I think it's more about being ready than it is to be intentionally have a plan by 5 o'clock today. It's more about recognizing that I'm not going to evaluate someone from a human point of view. I'm not going to decide for them that they are not interested in Jesus. Yeah, but they've said 20 times, they hate religion. Okay. There's a smoke screen there. <laughs> they've said it 100 times. But don't decide for them, human point of view, if they're going to be interested in the gospel, if they really hear it clearly. Because my guess is they may have a defense up against it, but maybe no one's ever shared it clearly or correctly. How differently we know him now? Because I said we used to think of Christ as a human point of view. He was just a baby. Nope. He showed himself as God before he left at age 33. How differently we know him now? This means that anyone, that just keeps popping up, who belongs to Christ to become a new person, the old life is gone, a new life has begun. And because we're compelled by that truth that God changes life, this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. People are disconnected from God. God's asking you to get them reconnected. Wow. So scripture says, like the shepherd wanted to change the script, and the director says, right, well, that's what the Bible says. You know, God would disagree. That's what he meant when he said it. He's given us this task of reconnecting people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. He must wonder sometimes. That's the best I got, them. But he's making his appeal to your friends through you. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. The glory of Christmas is for you. Trust God. When we share that message, we're representing God. We're his ambassador. If you fly to Zimbabwe this afternoon, just picked a country out of my, off the top of my head, uh, and landed and had some issue, uh, and as an American citizen got really scared, you know, something bad is going to happen, you could go to the U.S. Embassy. You know who's in there? The U.S. Ambassador. You know what his job is? To have your back to represent our nation and your citizenship, even though you're thousands of miles away. There are people, again, in your life. They are a child of God, and the gift of Christmas is for them. They just don't know it. You say, oh, they should know it. They're in America. They just don't know it. They're hoping somebody that does know it Heaven will represent heaven to them. And it just might be you. We are Christ's ambassadors. He's making his appeal through you as you say, come back to God. A verse we have to put with us, one of my favorites, 1 Peter 3.15. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. So again, where does this whole idea start? Not by me pumping you up. And then saying, go straight to Meyer and tell somebody. That would just freak Meyer out. <laughs> we don't need that. It doesn't have to be some random person. It needs to be someone that knows you and trusts you. So start with the point of making sure you have your act right, is what it says. Set apart Christ as your Lord. Then, if someone asks you about your, your Christian hope, <laughs> no, you go, when's that going to happen? Anyone, anyone ask somebody, someone ask you this week about your Christian faith? Maybe someone did. Uh, I was at an MSU basketball game last night with 14,000 people, and that one person, you would think out of that, thousands of people, someone would walk up and say, hey, how about Jesus? Not one person said that. So what, what's he talking about here? He's talking about if you have set Christ truly apart as Lord of your life, it shows. And there will be times when someone will say, tell me about 
They'll, might, they'll probably won't say your relationship with Jesus. They'll say your religion. Tell me about your faith. There's something different about you. When somebody asks, then always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle, respectful way. So don't go bombard somebody in my But maybe prayerfully consider today, if you've received this gift, the application is, are you open to sharing it at least? Have you prayed specifically for opportunities? Say, God, I love following you, and I know there's some people that don't that would be way better off if they would. So if you want me to connect to one of them and share the truth of Christmas with them, A, give me the opportunity. B, help me be smart enough to recognize it. (laughs) Say, oh, is this an opportunity? And trust that you can be ready to share. You can be gentle. You can be respectful. And yet clearly tell someone the glory of Christmas, it's for them. I bring you good news of great joy that is for all people. If you've never accepted that, think about accepting it today. And if you're not sharing it, will you pray about sharing it? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your love as demonstrated. Scripture says, by sending Christ while we were still sinners. We know we don't, didn't deserve it, but you reached down into space and time in the person of Jesus. It's really cool that you told the shepherds about it first. So we can have no doubt that it includes everybody. And you're literally saying today, this gift, this baby, is for you. Help us believe that to the depths of our souls. And indeed, Lord, may we accept that truth if we never have. May we share it if we've already accepted it. With somebody even this week, we're open, Lord, to representing you. I pray for your blessing on each one here today as we kind of digest this truth as you spoke to the shepherds. pray for your blessing on them in Jesus' name. Amen.